Hello again, everyone, and welcome inside another edition of the Adam Jones Podcast presented by the Baltimore Banner. I'm just Jerry Coleman. He's the Laker apologist, the five-time former All-Star Adam Jones wearing the purple and gold very proudly. Hey, today in episode number 31, AJ, we have another exclusive. First, it was Eric DaCosta, and now it's the Ravens head coach, John Harbaugh, joining us here on the podcast. We'll talk all about the Ravens and the offseason and even get into some baseball chatter with the coach. And speaking of baseball, Adam will opine on the Orioles' new closer sensation. We'll talk about the impact of Otani on the road and also a baseball team that could be on the move to Sin City. Will it work out? We'll discuss that as well and bring you another edition of Socially Speaking, where we answer a social media post. You can reach us via social media at Adam Jones Pod on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and you'll qualify for a Miss Shirley's gift card. All right, let's bring him in. Enough talk. He has OTAs to get to. He is the longtime head coach of the Baltimore Ravens, making his appearance because I pestered him for months to join us here on the Adam Jones Podcast. He can vouch for that. He's Coach Harbaugh. How are you, Coach? Very true. It's uh, you have been all over me, but for Adam Jones, the Adam Jones podcast, man, <laughs> and for you too, Jerry, for you too. But uh, you guys do a great job, and it's uh, it's an honor to be with you. It's fun. We appreciate right. you, Coach. We greatly appreciate very, you. Very great. You're looking good, well, by I'll the start. way. Not you, Jerry, but you're looking great, by the Thank way. Thank you. Thank you. I'm playing a lot of paddle and riding the bikes to live in Barcelona, and uh, kids are keeping me young. That's beautiful. Lakers, yeah. huh? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, he's a Lakers apologist, but we're not going to talk about that right now. We have lots to get to. Let's start with the pigskin. And I would presume the NFL thinks highly of the Ravens, Coach, by looking at your schedule with the number of primetime games, uh, your reaction to the schedule, and, yes, another trip to London. Your feelings about that? Well, um, we, have, we have actually been pretty, pretty fortunate. We haven't had too many trips to London, only one. The problem is everybody remembers it just like – uh, the worst loss, I think, in the history of the, the Ravens or Baltimore sports. I don't know. It was really a bad day. But uh, so, you know, we got to try to try to wash that one away if we can. But uh, it's going to be great. You know, it's going to be a good trip. We're going to do it differently. We're going to go out earlier, try to flip the script a little bit if we can. Um, and, uh, you know, play the Titans, which is a great football team. And, and it's going to be a challenge. But we're looking forward to it. We got what three West Coast trips. We got a Christmas night game. So some different kind of games. How do you feel about that about, Christmas oh, oh, night oh, oh, game? Hold, hold on, real quickly with the Christmas night game. That's a big holiday. That is that true. Yeah, well, that's kind of how it works. So, as you know, as we know in sports, you know, you play when they tell you to play. And we'll set it up where we'll get the guys, you know, a good Christmas day, half a day at least with their families before we get on the you know, plane and stuff like that. But, you know, it's, it's exciting to go play in a game like that. I, you know, I, I like Christmas. I love Christmas. But I'm going to love Christmas even more if we get a win on Christmas night. You know, and it's going to be a – Tough game. I mean, the Niners are legit. They're going to be really talented. I, I, you know, both teams, we're planning on being in the you know, heat of a race right there. It'll be right toward the end of the season. I think it's just going to be a massive game. They're a very physical team, uh, you know, a very talented team. Uh, you know, I don't know who's going to be playing quarterback for them. We'll see. You know, Purdy, I don't know who, whatever. But they'll still be good. Uh, Kyle Juszczyk, you know, will be for those guys. Uh, so, you know, it'll be a big deal. But then the other challenge of that is coming back, on a short week coming back home with that travel Christmas night because we won't get back till two in the morning sometime. Then we've got to go play the Dolphins at home on a short week. So it's kind of a double challenge right there when you do something like that. Coach, I want to ask you to take us just a quick step back about London, about being international. Uh, we were talking about uh, we were talking to EDC last week about it, and he loves traveling. And he's I live in Barcelona now. He's going to travel to Barcelona. You and your wife and kids, you any travel destinations that you aspire to go to? I mean, you, you have a very busy schedule, obviously, or you have been to that you love to go to. Well, we have a lot of uh, aspirations. We haven't traveled too much. We have we did go to London. It was my parents' uh, 50th wedding anniversary and, uh, and Ingrid's uh, step-parents, basically, their, their, their 30th wedding anniversary. So we took them all out there for a little over a week and stayed right down in a, in a beautiful hotel right next to Buckingham Palace and so London's pretty cool. I really, oh, I really super. want to, yeah, I know. I really want to go to Italy, Sicily and Italy. I really want to, my wife really wants to go to Germany. Um, you know, Paris is not something. I mean, everybody's got to go to Paris, but I don't know. That's kind of down our list a little bit. Barcelona, we never even considered, but 
I've heard beautiful things about Spain. So kind of, yeah, I'd like to go to Europe. Now we are going to Vegas for the first time this summer, taking our daughter. She just turned 21. So we're going to go play a little blackjack in Vegas. Uh, okay. Never been, never been to Vegas. So what do you think? Uh, you had a football in Vegas game a lot. there. <laughs> we did have a football game there. Yeah. yeah but you get to go to Vegas this time. Uh, it's going to be hot. Um, set a limit. Set a limit. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I think, that's yeah, yeah. Set a limit and throw it like. Don't take your credit cards. Whatever you take, no. my mom told me this. Take whatever you're gonna take. If you're willing to risk all that, that's it for the night. Well, that's my rule. Like I, I, I don't mind. Like I like playing cards. I don't mind gambling, but I hate losing. I don't like losing oh, money. Duh. So, you know, Who's I'm not gonna go lose. Right? I'm not gonna lose much money. No yeah. way. Yeah. All right, since, since you brought up Las Vegas, I, this was one of my questions. The fact that the Super Bowl is in Las Vegas this year is kind of ironic to me in a lot of ways because, man, when you began your head coaching career, Las Vegas wasn't allowed to even advertise on the Super Bowl on television. Uh, they didn't want you going anywhere near that city, and now you're playing games and a Super Bowl there. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's crazy. I mean, now we get a lot of we – we do get some memos out every now and then about gambling and not gambling and all that, but – yeah, you know, it's just just the world changes all the time. So uh, no harm, no foul, I guess. Just, uh, you know, gamble responsibly, I suppose. Uh, you know, yep. who, who wants to lose money? So. Oh, you can't lose money. That's number one. You, don't, you do not want to lose money. Um, I want to ask something when it comes to baseball, basketball, football. You guys play 17. We play 162. They play right. 82. Hockey plays 82. Right. Your 17 is tough. I, I I don't care what you say. That's car wrecks all day. That's just it's brutal. You get to see these guys, you know, and how do you – how how the preparation as a coach? You got to mentally prepare that. Although you're not physically in it, you're physically in it in a way. I know you got to cringe when you see that that contact. Well, how, 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 do you, how do you handle that? Yeah, you're right. I mean, I mean that's – football is, <clears throat> is different because we practice all the time. More like I so it's it's like the games are such a big deal. They, there's so much riding on the game, so it becomes more of a like a work to a crescendo type of a situation when you play on Sunday. You're right, you couldn't play, you couldn't play 82 or certainly not 162 football games. I mean that would be it'd be impossible. But the win, the, the, there's so much riding on the game. There's so much emotions. I do think in baseball or basketball, you can kind of get in a little bit of a routine and you can kind of emotionally even out a little bit. In football, it's really emotional because you've got to pour everything you can into the game to try to win the game. And there's multiple games kind of within the game, you know, situationally, fourth quarter. It's kind of a complex game that way. So you're trying to win battles within the battle to win the ultimate battle. But no matter what happens, you walk off a winner or a loser, and it's kind of the equivalent of 10 wins or 10 losses in baseball, basically. So um, I, I just think just the preparation part of it is, is very intense. And the, and, the, and the moment is big because so much is riding on each and every play. I guess I, that's what's exciting about it for me. I, mean, I can't imagine what you guys went through. Just you got to, you know, you got. I think it's so competitive, just the one-on-one -on -one nature of the sport. And to do it day in and day out, you know, the stakes so high and have to perform, it's kind of a, just a completely different mindset yet at the highest level. It's just sports are different. You know, they're, they're just different sports, different mindsets. Yeah, you would have to meet with the media a lot more than you do right now if you were a baseball manager, that's for sure, before well, seen, and after every game. Yeah, right. And some of those baseball rants that you see, you know, right? Lee Elias, remember that one, the Cubs oh, and yeah. things like that? I oh, love yeah. Things, that was, that oh, was the greatest rant ever in the history of rants. Historically. And then how about, you know, like, well, think about football. Like, if I could, like, like, brush the plate over, kick dirt on the referee's shoes, I would love that. I would love that baseball manager. Yeah, but you would awesome if they get You wouldn't want to call your fan base unemployed and, and stuff like that, like he did. Lee Ilya is who it was uh, many Ilya. years ago oh, as a Cubs no, manager. Yeah, because all those all those fans. That's a good thing about yeah, playing those... on Sunday. Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. We've got more ahead with our exclusive conversation with Ravens coach John Harbaugh. But first, let's support our dedicated sponsors who make this podcast possible. 
The Adam Jones Podcast with Adam Jones and Jerry Coleman will be live, and you can be part of the audience and meet Adam for the first time since he played for the O's. It all goes down on Thursday, July 27th at 8 p.m. Doors open at 7, and tickets are limited, but now on sale. Go to BaltimoreSoundstage.com or Ticketmaster.com or call 410-244-0057 to be a part of the action. This will be the first time Adam and Jerry have done the podcast in the same spot, and who knows, maybe the last. So don't miss this unique night. The Adam Jones Podcast, live at Soundstage, July 27th. See you there. The Adam Jones Podcast is brought to you by Be More Around Town. Be More Around Town is reminding you that football season is around the corner. Hashtag Purple Road Trip. Be More Around Town's trips are all-inclusive. Airfare, hotel parties, special guest tours, and more. They're all ready for the Ravens game in London. They have over 300 deposits. Just pack your bags, get your passport, and meet them at the airport. Besides London calling, Be More Around Town also has road trips for all away games. Arizona, L.A., San Francisco, Jacksonville, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, and Cincy. Head to Be More Around Town and find a hashtag purple road trip for you and your friends and family. Be more around town.com. Buy our good friends at the Weinman Company. By Hollywood Casino Perryville. For some, it's a game of chance, but for you, it's a game of choice. Hollywood and Barstool are bringing you more ways to bet in Maryland. Catch all the action in person at Hollywood Casino Perryville at the Barstool Sportsbook or bet online with the Barstool Sportsbook app. When you download the Barstool Sportsbook app, register and wager, you can get up to $1,000 bonus cash, plus up to $1,000 when you sign up and wager in person at Hollywood Casino Perryville. Play from anywhere and get up to $2,000. The choice is yours. Must be in the state of Maryland to wager and over 21. Please play responsibly. For help, visit mdgamblinghelp.org or call 1-800-GAMBLER. By Jack Daniels, two legends, one can. Jack and Coke, the number one cocktail in the world, is now available in a can. Yes, that's true. Jack Daniels Tennessee Whiskey, mixed with Coca-Cola or Coca-Cola Zero Sugar, are now both available in a can. Two legends, one can. Jack and Coke, ready to drink? Please drink responsibly. Whiskey specialty, 7% alcohol by volume. Jack Daniels Tennessee Whiskey, Lynchburg, Tennessee. By G-Leaf, medical cannabis only. Visit gleaf.com. Medical cannabis is for qualified Maryland patients only. The Adam Jones Podcast is brought to you by royal farms download the royal farms app from the apple app store or google play today new royal farms rewards members will get a free any size cup of royal farms award-winning coffee just for signing up royal farms real fresh real fast you know it takes a lot of hard work to be a professional football kicker i would know i am a professional football kicker so when i need the energy to get through a tough practice i get a cup of coffee from Royal Farms. Royal Farms' new coffee machines grind fresh beans and brew them for a perfect cup every time. (sighs) It's the freshest coffee in the world and just the kick I need. Real fresh, real fast. Royal Farms. And a reminder, if you guys are enjoying this podcast, make sure to check out the Baltimore Banner at thebaltimorebanner.com slash AJ to get started. Again, that's thebaltimorebanner.com slash AJ to get six months of unlimited digital access for only a dollar. And now back to the Adam Jones podcast interview with Ravens head coach, John Harbaugh. All right, back to football real quickly. And the, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't ask about the quarterback. Lamar has been paid. Lamar Jackson has been paid. Whether or not he's a participant in all the OTAs, we don't know. I don't know if you know. Maybe you do. But it's not mandatory, except for the mandatory camp. So how much can be accomplished with him or without him? Yeah, well, Lamar's going to be ready, and he's going to be here doing the things he needs to do to learn the offense and be involved. And we're going to pace that out just a little bit. Like, I don't, I don't need him to be in there running, running the team thing full speed the first day or anything like that. That's really not the most important thing. The most important thing – is that we pace him and the offense up together. So you got to work Odell in. we got to work Mark in. A lot of the younger guys have been here already. Tyler and, uh, and Anthony have been, have been running the offense even up until this OTA week that we're having right now. So uh, we're going to just pace our way up a little bit. But Lamar is going to merge in full speed as he goes, and he'll be ready to roll. I think he'll be rolling in minicamp. I know he'll be rolling in training camp. And, and uh, I'm just excited, man. I'm excited for him. <clears throat> I'm excited for the, uh, the weapons we got around him. The offensive line is going to be really good. And, you know, I, I don't think people should forget about our defense because I think our defense has a chance to be, you know, if not the best, certainly one of the best in the National Football League. I, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't ask this. The tweet, the ambush of the tweet, I should say. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because I'm, I'm part of the new era of social media. We yeah express our feelings this way instead of screaming outside in the woods. Yeah. Um, 
the ambush of the tweet. I mean, it, it caught everybody off guard. I mean, yeah. it was it was crazy, man. And it's funny because you're such a great fan of, of all of athletes and sports. I remember you being in the tunnel of playoff games we've had and stuff like that, and just how into it you are. And and then you study it, and then you did. You've had both sides of it. You know how the business part of it goes too, and all that. And it was surprising. I, mean, I can't sit here and say I wasn't surprised, but I really kind of wasn't surprised either because we knew that he had asked for the trade, which had happened, I don't know, maybe two weeks, two, two weeks, three weeks, whatever it was, he'd asked for the trade at the combine. And uh, as he said since, that was more of a negotiating tactic. Now, I don't know because I think emotions do run high and we're all humans, and I think we all understood that at the time. But we just, you know, we just knew, Adam, that the relationships were, were intact, that we cared about each other. But I, I, there was always going to be frayed edges, you know, it's always part of it. But when I, when I walked up there, I didn't expect the conversation to be about that because it seemed like that was more of a private thing. So when it came out uh, and the timing of it where all of a sudden I sat down and everybody's on their phones, and then all of a sudden, and Jerry, you know how this works at, that, at those owners meetings. It went from a big crowd because they wanted to talk about Lamar to everybody was at our table. And it became like six, seven, eight deep cameras. Uh, and and it was people look at their phones and say, what do you have to say about – Lamar just tweeting that he, he requested a trade and he wants to he wants to be traded. And and here's the deal. I was like, whatever reason, I had a sense of calm came right over me. And I actually prayed a, a quiet prayer. I just said, just Lord, just help me to be calm and give me the right words. And it just kind of hit me right then that, you know, this isn't about business. I mean, this isn't about like emotions. It's not about wanting, not wanting. It's all just about business. You know, this is part of the process. It's not really surprising. There's going to be tactics involved, I'm sure. There's advisors advising tactics and all that. So if it's not really about this little thing, don't make it about this thing. And for some reason, and also the voice said, just keep smiling, just keep smiling, you know. And, uh, and uh, thankfully just was able to kind of get through it without saying something that would have been damaging. But Lamar, and we go back a long way. You know, Lamar knows five years ago, <clears throat> he knows what we th think of him, and, and he knows, and I know how he feels about us. I know he appreciates the fact that we are the team that believed in him, and we are still the team that believes in him, obviously more than any other team, you know, <clears throat> and that's not going to change. And I think when we got through all that, uh, Hurt signed, the draft was coming up, and just it just kind of became clear what the probably it became clear what the numbers were for Eric and and um, and Lamar in the negotiation. You know, I'm not part of that specifically, but I think they probably just kind of said, "Hey, you know what's time," and you know it worked out like as Eric said, like in a couple minutes it was done. And it's crazy how that goes. You go all these years, and all of a sudden, boom, it's done in three minutes. Uh, I guess that's how business works in sports. So obviously, you know. <clears throat> A lot of athletes obviously tweet a lot. That's just the way they express themselves. Mm -hmm. You're an old school guy. You came from a different era mm -hmm. where, you know, this this was not here. This was this wasn't around. It was, I remember my mom carrying around that big one from, you know, uh, from Lethal Weapon. All of them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how have you kept up with this era when it comes to culture? When it comes to music. I mean, the clubhouse music has to have changed. Yeah. The food has to have changed. Everything had the yeah. attire. How they wear it in zoot? They used to wear it in zoot suits when you first came in, for sure. Ninety Steve Harvey, eight buttons. Now these guys wearing. I mean, yeah. the style I've always been more changed. Classic mode kind of guy. <laughs> How have you kept up with this? How have you kept up with this era as this it is ever evolving? Such a great question, you know. And I, I, I don't know. I mean, I like the music I like, um, but you know, like we play music at practice. We play music in the locker room. It's the players. The players pick the song. I just say, hey, you know, I get a couple songs here too, you know, come on. And they, <laughs> and they say they like my songs, so that's cool. But, uh, you know, one thing we do say is we say, hey, we're not going to be offensive. We're not going to, like, impose um, offensive type message on one another. You know, everybody's got different types of things that they want to hear, but certain words aren't going to be used. Certain messages aren't going to be in, in our public, you know, space that we're sharing. You put your earphones on, you want to hear whatever you want to hear. I wouldn't, I tell him, I said, I wouldn't recommend it because I'm going to be judicious about what goes into my mind. I'm protecting my brain so I can guard my heart. That's just me. And I would advise you to do the same. But 
you know, hey, everybody's got their own taste, their own style. And uh, you can, and style, you know, the guys, the, the music, some of the songs I think are great. Some of the songs I'm like, oh man, they're cringeworthy. But, you know, we don't let, we just try to keep the messages right. And that's all we really do. So style is, is everybody's choice, but principles and values, you know, they, they, we, those things really don't change. Those are standards that, that are, are going to be high from, they're self-evident and they're going to be high from now until, they're going to, from now until eternity, they're going to be high standards. And we're going to hold on to that in our organization and our team and all kinds of stuff. And I think guys respect it because we got kids in the locker room, Adam. We got our, our kids are allowed to come around. They're at practice or they're on the sideline watching. So, you know, it's got to be worthy of our families and, and them hearing it too. And our guys love that. I mean, they, they believe in that. So it's really, it's like you say, styles, methods can change and they have, but principles and values and things being right and what's right is right. It really does, never changes. Those things are lasting and eternal. And you've evolved as a coach. I've seen it since day one, having been fortunate to cover you and pester you, as I said at the top of this interview, since day one. And that pestering will continue. Back to Lamar real quickly. At the press conference, you're sitting right next to him when he says his goal is to throw for 6,000 yards. Now, you kept your game face on at that point, but your reaction to that, because aren't you still a run-first team coach? Well, no, I mean, we've never, we've never been a run first or a pass first philosophy. You, that strategy, like we said, methods change. We've, we've thrown the ball all over the place. The Super Bowl year, we were throwing it. We've, we've thrown it, you know, Kubiak was a downfield off play action. We've had all kinds of offensive philosophies. I'd say defensively, probably a little more locked in, you know, strategically in a certain pattern in terms of like the way we like to play in terms of pressure and things like that. But offensively we've been all over the yard over the years and i think offensively it really does gear toward who you have i mean how about the joe flacco offense versus the lamar jackson offense from 18 to 19 right i mean that's a sea change and so it wasn't grounded in anything other than good fundamental football that's what we believe in we want to we want to we want to keep pressure on the off on the defense we want to move the ball we want to we want to move the change we want to back a team up we want to we want to hit big plays as much as we can we always want to go, go the short route and go the easy route whenever we can. And we certainly want to take care of the football and never turn it over. But within that, I don't care if you throw it, run it, options, downhill, sweeps, crack tosses, play actions. Who cares? You know, I, one thing I do believe all the time, and Adam, you'll appreciate this, is keeping it moving. We never want to get in a place where we're predictable or where the opponent can expect and anticipate what we're going to do. You know, when, when we're zigging, they're zigging. Or expect us to zag. I want to be zigging, zagging, zagging, and zigging, and keep it moving in terms of them not anticipating what we're going to do next. That's the most important thing, I think. So you got to be able to live in a lot of different worlds when you do that. Uh, run, pass, and different types of schemes. Uh, no huddle tempo. But I do think with Lamar, you build it around him. You want to be in that no tempo, move fast, make decisions at the line of scrimmage, get a defense tired out, and let Lamar play the way he likes to play. And within that, I'm sure that will be uh, run past, no huddle, and different kind of tempos and things like that. I think he might have said 6,000 because he got, he got a fresh, healthy receiver. I don't care if you say he's 31 or 30, 30 31. He's fresh. I've been, I'm, I'm a firm believer that, he, you know, uh, in a, my father-in-law, Gene Fugit, played NFL in the 70s. He said he only got so many hits. Right. This OBJ is coming off a fresh year. I don't know if you've met him at all. I mean, I'm sure at this point oh, yeah. you probably have. Oh, yeah. Um, impressions of him. I mean, he, obviously explosive. We know what he has done. What does he have left in the tank in your, you know, your estimations? Right. Well, I think your point is really perceptive and true because, you know, you're talking about um, a guy that has had spectacular career. And yet, even in the last three or four years, there's not a lot of tread on, off the tire. And he's a year and a half away from the injury now. He's been training the whole time. The guy works hard, man. He's and uh, and he's really hungry and he, he's determined to, to make to prove and make a statement. So, you know, to me, OBJ right at the right time, perfect intersection with him and Lamar. And then Nelson Aguilar has been in here. He is so talented. I mean, he's way. I, I knew he's a good player, but I didn't really understand the talent level quite until you're around him and you see him in practice. Very talented, big, fast receiver. Uh, then the other guys, you know, that we already have in the mix, adding Zay, of course. I just think, I just think, you know, the, 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 it's it's the right right time 
to really break out offensively. And we definitely will be throwing it more than we were. It wasn't even last year. It wasn't that we didn't want to spread it out, didn't want to throw it, but the personnel did dictate to Greg to a degree that, you know, we were going to have to play a certain kind of a way. And then Lamar gets hurt and you got to, you got to protect and you're trying to win the game. And it was working, you know, and we were, we would have won that Bengals game. I really believe that if we hadn't made the, you know, the big mistake on the goal line there. So, and that's what, what turns games, but um, we, we were trying to play the best we could with what we had at that time to win games and play to our defense a little more. That's going to change Adam this year because of like you're saying, those offensive weapons, man, that gives you an opportunity to open things up. 6,000 yards. Hey, I'm all for it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we get over 4,000 yards. That would be spectacular, you know, and that's to me, you know, 4,000 yards would be a great goal. I still think we want to run it for, you know, a lot of yards. I mean, you know, what that number is, I don't know, 2,000 something, whatever it ends up being, but we're still going to try to run the ball. But I would think more explosive plays, run and pass would be a big part of where we're going this year. Coach, as you know, they don't play this game on paper, but on paper right now, the AFC North looks like the strongest division in the NFL. I don't know what other division you may compare it to. And I guess what goes with that question is any pressure to go deep into the playoffs with the team that you've assembled this year? I mean, you guys have had some runs, but none long recently. So is there some sort of inherent pressure that comes with the acquisitions and the way the team has evolved here? Well, I think there's always pressure. I mean, I know darn well, Jerry, you expect that you expect us to go far every year, you know, and that's a standard that you want to be held to. I, I don't really want to be coaching that team that if you go nine and seven, everybody's thrilled. Or if you go 500, everybody's like, wow, that's a successful year. That's not really what we're looking for. We want to be the team that if we don't go deep in the playoffs, that people are disappointed. That's, that's what you work hard for. And every year for the last, you know, four or five years, uh, I've been fully expecting us to go deep in the playoffs. So the fact that we have it absolutely sticks in your craw, all of us. You know, we all are hurt and stung by that. You know, I, I felt like last year, as, as we were building through the season, I thought we were going to win the whole thing. I felt like we were going to beat Cincinnati, beat Kansas City, beat Buffalo. I thought we were going to do it. You know, I felt very strongly that we had the team to do it. And that's why it hurts so much, and, you know, to, to have that happen and, and all of a sudden you're knocked out and then you don't, then you watch the games and I'm looking at the games and I'm like, man, I, I, we're going to, we would have won this game, you know, just like the fans do. I feel, and all of us feel the exact same way about it. So yes, if we don't go deep, you know, we'll be disappointed, but it's hard. It's competitive and everybody, you know, everybody worth their salt is feeling the exact same way in our league. So we're going to, I know one thing we're going to play, we're going to throw it out there and we're going to play super hard. We're going to fly around and hit people. We're going to knock people off the ball. We're going to play fast. We're going to be looking for big plays. All the things I think that I know I want to see and our fans want to see, we're going to be fighting our tails off to make that happen. And I really believe we're going to make it happen. We want to believe in, 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 into existence to make it happen. It starts with that. And our players feel that way right now, too. So we're just ready to go to work. Thanks so much, Coach. Listen, I appreciate all the honesty, all the answers, but we know you have a real job to do besides being on the Adam Jones podcast. What do you say we continue this conversation next week? And among the topics, we're going to have to ask you about how much longer you want to hold this job here in Baltimore and what the future may behold. All right, Adam, let's transition to For the Birds, our segment where we talk about who else? The Orioles. We just covered the Ravens. And right. this kid, Yanir Cano, the 29-year-old who basically had to escape from Cuba. Uh, he was... He was really held back by the Cuban authorities. He has burst onto the scene here in Baltimore and already maybe a bit premature. Some have mentioned the name Mariano Rivera in the same sentence, but he has been lights out thus far and a pleasure to watch. Oh, I'll pump the brakes on the Mariano, but I, I don't want to harp on, you know, his story to get here. Obviously, it's a uh, heroic. Uh, a lot of trials and tribulations he went through. Um, I've talked to numerous Cubans that, I, that I've played with and, you know, been able to get partial of their stories, not all of their stories, but just understand that, man, the road that the Cubans have to get here to play in America is unbelievable. And sometimes it's not a road, right? No, it's still 100% not a road. It is, it is, it is the ocean and, yes. um, it's, it's tough and they have to leave back family, they have to leave back friends, loved ones <clears throat> to be able to pursue, you know, such a great talent. And, you know, it's amazing when they're able to get their families over 
And man, what Cano is able to, to be, be doing right now, uh, he's 29. He's he came up last year with Minnesota with the Orioles. What couldn't throw strikes, dropped down a little bit. He's still throwing as hard. He has the most run, the most everything. If you want to get into analytics in the game right now for a reliever, I mean in baseball, he has a changeup that's 90, 91 that is unhittable. Um, I mean, tip of the cap of what he's doing, tip of the cap of uh, Elias for trading and finding this guy. You know what I mean? You like, you just like, oh, a 29 year old in double A, triple A, you know, just lingering. <clears throat> but you got to understand he's a Cuban, so they age a little differently, okay? They, they, they 28, 29 is like 23, 24. They age different, they play forever. Um, but this, what a hell of a find right now. Him and Bautista at the back end of the bullpen is, is, is petrifying. That's a good word to use for yep. for teams. When they have to see them come through, it reminds me of seeing Batances and Rivera. It reminds me of seeing Batances and whoever the hell was following. You know what I mean? It's just uh, – or go back to the Royals when you had uh, Holland, Wade, Davis, and um, and Herrera. When You know what I mean? Just have a, just a back end and, you know, come to the Orioles when you had – uh, who the hell did we have? Oh, O'Day and Britain. When you knew, hey, hey, we got this game in, in lock. So he's dominant, and it's great to see. It's great to see the Orioles continue to put the game in his him in Bautista's hands because that means that you're up. So continue doing what you're doing, scrap, and get these guys to lead because it's shown right now that they're able to hold it. It certainly makes you feel good entering the eighth when the Orioles have the lead, no doubt about that. And- Hopefully it continues for Mr. Cano. Nothing but respect for what he has done. Hopefully, right, hopefully see him at the All-Star right. game, bro. I'll, I'll be at the All-Star game. Hopefully I can see him there. That would be great. I know some good places in uh, in Seattle. I can find some Cuban food for him to make sure that he's good. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? Hey, I know where I'm You know what I mean? I'm going to be everywhere. He's certainly a candidate right now and well-deserved. All right, let's venture beyond Baltimore. And speaking of All-Stars, uh, I think Shohei Otani will be at the Midsummer Classic. I wanted to ask you about – the impact he has had. We talked about him in our last episode a little bit, but the impact on the road in terms of attendance, I was there when he was in Baltimore. They had a bump. They had a bump all throughout the series because of him, because especially when he pitches at him, that's like a double pleasure for fans. Of course. Um, I mean, we talked about it. It was some of the attendance. Me and you discussed it and you gave me the numbers. It was a a little bit over 11,000 when Tampa was in on a Monday. Okay. And then Otani comes in, and the, and the Angels comes in, and it's twenty-one thousand, or just under twenty-one one thousand, uh, when he pitches on the Monday. And then it's solid crowds the rest of the week. I think at mid mid twenty-five thousand or something like that, uh, the mm-hmm. final game of the series. So it's like the impact that he's he has on baseball and society right now is explosive. It doesn't matter who you are, you want to see Otani. Trout is still polarizing. Trout, I mean, Otani for some, is glare is, I don't know, mere mortal, I guess, for, for somebody, for everybody right now. And he's the hot ticket. And if you get to see him, again, uh, our, our, our lovely uh, uh, senior producer did the research for me and uh, said that there's, there's what, uh, 11,000, approximately 11,000 more in attendance yeah. when he pitches. So that just shows you, you get two for the price of one. And I mean, you're a fool not to go out and see this guy. He's tremendous. And, again, you know what's great is the Angels are playing winning baseball right now. So catch them while they're hot. You never know when they, that decline goes. But you're able to see, you know, two of the best players in the world right now. And Otani, obviously, is a, is a ticket drawer. So as a fan of the game, I try to watch a lot. It's great that every game that he plays in is televised in Japan. So he pitches and he hits. So literally every, all games are televised. So – all the kids right now are Otani fans uh, and and uh, Masataki Yoshida fans with Boston and say it's Suzuki fans. So the effect is big on the Japanese right now across the baseball and it, it's it, it's a hot ticket. So fans go out and see him. I'll say in conclusion, it's very tough to take a bathroom break when he is pitching <laughs> because when he's pitching and hitting, there's not much time. And if the line's too long, you may miss something special. So. I make sure to hold it in if possible when he's on the mound. All right, let's venture beyond Baltimore where Adam resides. Of course, he will be in Baltimore at some point. We'll have an announcement coming soon. 
But this week, as we venture Baltimore and beyond, I did want to talk about the news about the Oakland Athletics supposedly moving to Las Vegas, Sin City. Will it work out? I'm skeptical. They're talking about putting a stadium right in the middle of the strip. I know the Mm -hmm. Raiders, in terms of attendance, I did the research on my own. They were third from the bottom in terms of home attendance. You think all these people want to come in and experience Vegas in a football game, but maybe you know they just wanted to experience Vegas and not the game. That's surprising. Will it work? That I mean, I I think it could. They say about a retractable roof. It's super surprising that you said that the the Raiders were third to the bottom because there's a lot of Raiders fans that are that just California fans, the Raiders fans that have moved and migrated to either Arizona or to Vegas, more affordable cities. You're right, and, but they may have been priced out. And, they but, may have been priced yeah, out. I, they may have been priced out on the tickets, but man, it's crazy. My brothers was there. My there were so many people I knew was there. I mean, with good seats. And they're paying good price for them. But, I mean, like, again, coming in town, I don't know. I mean, I, again, I, that surprises me because, you know, but, again, it doesn't because it's a Sunday. And people do what on Sunday? You leave Vegas. You don't stay in Vegas. Um, maybe that's maybe that's it. Maybe they need to play Saturday games. Uh, <laughs> uh, they yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> good luck but I'm that. saying I don't, I, that's a good – that's a really good uh, – that's that's wild for them, but I think the A's work because it's baseball. Uh, I love baseball more than all. I ever see you know sports, basketball would work in Vegas too. Um, highest gambling, um, but I think baseball work because just again you can if you build it where they're talking about near the strip, you can just get a lot of foot traffic. Hopefully, uh, and again a lot of people who were uh, Oakland fans or just lived in the California and grew up Oakland fans, again, have migrated to the Vegas area. And, um, you know, hopefully, it's again, it's a 30,000-seat stadium proposed, 30, 35,000. More than enough. These 50,000-seat stadiums are, huge, are incredibly just large. That's why the Diamondbacks are mad. They got a 51,000. They're like, oh, we built this way too big. Yeah, you did. You didn't think you thought people was going to come. Mm-mm. Yeah. Um, so I think the the... the being smaller is be better. So even 15,000, 20,000 looks a little bit more appeasing on camera. You know what I mean? Um, well, you're only, right about think, one thing. I think it works. I think it works. All right. Well, you're right about one thing. They've ever put a roof over it because summer's in yes. Las Vegas. Oh, 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 man. Oh. Oh. Hey, boy, woo, scorching hot. I played there. They have a team still out there out in Summerlin. That's why, they, they, you know, that's one thing that's, a, that's kind of a crazy thing. But I think they're going on. They're going to try and bank on the tourism. If I was counting on anything, and you know, there's a lot of visitors. There's, again, Vegas has a lot of people from all over the United States, also. So when the visiting team comes in, you know, it's not just the large cities that get the big draws from the Yankees and Red Sox and Cubs fans. You know, the the Vegas, which is you know middle of the road when it comes to marketing, uh, you know, it's just sin city for gambling and all that other stuff. But they, you know. There's more people out there that uh, I think like Minnesota Twins fans and stuff like that. There could be a home field advantage. I want to end on this. There's something out there called the Vegas flu. And when you're there for three or four nights in Las Vegas, it may impact you more than per se a visiting football team or hockey team. So the A's may have a home field advantage. We'll see. I know baseball doesn't like moving franchises, but. Uh, Oakland hasn't done much to try and keep their team. Hey, All right. Good thing is that I was 20 in AAA, and I and when I went to Vegas for the first time, so I was unable to go out. So mm-hmm. uh, I was I had a hell of a series there because I got a good night's sleep and I just like got to hear all the stories of guys and was jealous and was just took all my anger out on the ball because I got a good night rest. <laughs> Allegedly. And we'll leave it at that and transition to our socially speaking segment where we answer a tweet, a Facebook post. Heck, you could rate us our podcast five stars on Apple Podcasts and you automatically qualify for a Miss Shirley's gift card. That's one way to qualify. This week we got a tweet and the tweet comes from at Seth Jones 17. Seth writes. Adam, what was your favorite part of your time in Arizona? Speaking of the Diamondbacks, we just were. 
my favorite time in Arizona was being right near my mom. Um, she literally, I mean, she rivals that in Paradise Valley. She's still downtown stadium. She's in the west side. I was like, Mom, come over. She's like, nah, I see you at the ballpark. Mom, come over to the house for dinner. Nah, I see you at the ballpark. I see you after the game. <laughs> yeah. like, Mom, come over. Nah, I see you at the ballpark. So what was great is that uh, about my time there is that I never had to ask for tickets. I did the like opening day, um, got tickets, and you know I guess my mom just bogarted her way to just parking in the players' lot next to me, and there in the stands. And I'm like, either she was in the family section right in the, right up there. But she was like, she always never, she never liked to sit in the family section. She don't want to listen to this. She always says, the catty women, and I don't want to listen to that. Um, so she I was like generally that. in right, yeah, she was generally in right field. She always looked, she was, you know, seen what, uh, asked me what I was doing and if I was playing, obviously, um, or not. Um, but she was generally. She wanted to be close to you. She wanted to be closer 100%. to you. So she always be in right field. So what I would do is I would, uh, I would throw the ball to her try to throw the ball to her because she was high up. So fans would like start to get to get uh, like an idea of it and I'd be, they'd all be around her and I'd try to throw a ball to her all the time. She gets so mad. She's like, why are you trying to hit me? I don't want you to throw a ball to me. And my stepdad, he never caught one. But uh, I was like always trying to throw a ball to her. She gets so mad at that. But yeah, that was my favorite time in Arizona. Obviously working with a lot of young players, a lot of new players, new organization. It was always, it's always cool to be, you know, to learn something new. But uh, my mom being there was obviously the, the highlight of it because I had her there for 81 games, 81 days. And then San Diego, what, what else you got to do? L.A. She don't like L.A. because it's impossible to get to the stadium. So, but, uh, you know, and if she wanted to come to any other cities, yeah, she had it all down. So it was really good having her right, just right at the back tips and never had to pay for a ticket. That's an awesome story, and she found the right yeah. parking too. Thank you, Seth, for oh, that yeah. question. We appreciate that. And again, reach us at Adam Jones Pod, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or on Apple Podcasts there in the rating part. All right, time to thank our dedicated, loyal sponsors who make this podcast possible. The Adam Jones Podcast with Adam Jones and Jerry Coleman will be live, and you can be part of the audience and meet Adam for the first time since he played for the O's. It all goes down on Thursday, July 27th at 8 p.m. Doors open at 7, and tickets are limited, but now on sale. Go to BaltimoreSoundStage.com or Ticketmaster.com or call 410-244-0057 to be a part of the action. This will be the first time Adam and Jerry have done the podcast in the same spot, and who knows, maybe the last. So don't miss this unique night the adam jones podcast live at soundstage july 27th see you there the adam jones podcast is brought to you by be more around town be more around town is reminding you that football season is around the corner hashtag purple road trip be more around town's trips are all inclusive airfare hotel party special guest tours and more they're all ready for the ravens game in london they have over 300 deposits just pack your bags get your passport and meet them at the airport besides london calling be more around town also has road trips for all away games arizona Arizona, LA, San Francisco, Jacksonville, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, and Cincy. Head to BeMoreAroundTown.com and find a hashtag Purple Road Trip for you and your friends and family. BeMoreAroundTown.com. By our good friends at the Weinman Company. By Hollywood Casino Perryville. For some, it's a game of chance, but for you, it's a game of choice. Hollywood and Barstool are bringing you more ways to bet in Maryland. Catch all the action in person at Hollywood Casino Perryville at the Barstool Sportsbook or bet online with the Barstool Sportsbook app. When you download the Barstool Sportsbook app, register and wager, you can get up to $1,000 bonus cash, plus up to $1,000 when you sign up and wager in person at Hollywood Casino Perryville. Play from anywhere and get up to $2,000. The choice is yours. Must be in the state of Maryland to wager and over 21. Please play responsibly. For help, visit mdgamblinghelp.org or call 1-800-GAMBLER. By Jack Daniels, two legends, one can. Jack and Coke, the number one cocktail in the world, is now available in a can. Yes, that's true. Jack Daniels Tennessee Whiskey, mixed with Coca-Cola or Coca-Cola Zero Sugar, are now both available in a can. Two legends, one can. Jack and Coke, ready to drink? Please drink responsibly. Whiskey specialty, 7% alcohol by volume. Jack Daniels Tennessee Whiskey, Lynchburg, Tennessee. By G-Leaf, medical cannabis only. Visit gleaf.com. Medical cannabis is for qualified Maryland patients only. The Adam Jones Podcast is brought to you by 
Royal Farms. Download the Royal Farms app from the Apple App Store or Google Play today. New Royal Farms Rewards members will get a free any size cup of Royal Farms award winning coffee just for signing up. Royal Farms, real fresh, real fast. You know, it takes a lot of hard work to be a professional football kicker. I would know. I am a professional football kicker. So when I need the energy to get through a tough practice, I get a cup of coffee from Royal Farms. Try those beans. Royal Farms' new coffee machines grind fresh beans and brew them for a perfect cup every time. It's the freshest coffee in the world and just the kick I need. Real fresh, real fast. Royal Farms. And a reminder, if you guys are enjoying this podcast, make sure to check out the Baltimore Banner at thebaltimorebanner.com slash AJ to get started. Again, that's thebaltimorebanner.com slash AJ to get six months of unlimited digital access for only a dollar. Next week, more of our exclusive conversation with Coach Harbaugh, part due, if you will, because I don't think we covered everything, Adam. We've got a lot more to get to. So join us next week. And tell a friend or family member about this podcast. Thanks to senior executive producer Chip Franklin for putting this episode together. He works fast. He works smart. He works out west. Until then, go out and subscribe to the banner. Subscribe to the podcast. Be real. Be kind. And as I always say, be back next week for another episode of the Adam Jones Podcast. 